Welcome to Convince Me in 15 Minutes. This podcast will introduce you to concepts, theories, and philosophies in the world of finance, investing, and wealth management explained in 15 minutes. Your guides are Keith Thompson and Luke Tawis. Hi, everyone. My name is James DeVolis. I'm a portfolio manager with Horizon Kinetics, a value-based investment firm based out of New York City. And I am here to convince you today that we are entering a new economic regime of higher and volatile inflation and interest rates, and then that the best investment strategy for this environment is real assets. So on the first slide, I think that this is one of the most important slides that really gets overlooked by people, but this goes back uh, about 10 years, and it shows that nominal GDP So again, this is nominal dollars, not adjusted for inflation, has grown 24% since uh, since 2019. So even though the chart goes back a decade, this shows you just the the big break from that trend, particularly in the blue line, which is the nominal growth rate since 2019, when we basically saw inflation, the beginnings of inflation with COVID stimulus. But you'll notice that real GDP, so GDP adjusted for inflation, has only grown 6%. So when you think about the real growth in your economic net worth, that's only grown 6%. Now, a big part of this dynamic has been that total debt since the beginning of the pandemic has grown by nearly 40%, but debt to GDP has only grown by 14%. Now, the only way that that's possible is through the nominal growth of uh, the economy vis-a-vis inflation. So in no small or short order, the government actually needs inflation to balance the budget and to continue kind of the status quo. And that's why we think that even though the the Fed seems to be intent and seems to be communicating uh, combating inflation, we think, A, that they will be unsuccessful through monetary means particularly because of the fiscal situation, which we'll go through later, but also because if you look at what is in the best interest of the federal government, it is having nominal growth in excess of our debt service costs, because absent that, you actually have a steadily increasing debt to GDP ratio, as opposed to a steadily decreasing debt to GDP ratio. So slide two shows you what I think a lot of people have been calling out and right very recently, you've been seeing a bit more attention being paid to the federal deficit problems. But basically the entirety of economic growth, unfortunately, particularly this year, has been funded by government spending deficits. So for the current year, the estimated budget deficit of the federal government, and bear in mind, This excludes entitlement programs such as Social Security and things like that, where that's going to be kind of kicked down the road much later. The actual cash on cash deficit is $1.7 trillion. That's with a T. That's relative to a nominal GDP of about $26.8 trillion. So that amounts to approximately a 6.4% budget deficit. This is almost equivalent to the height of the budget deficit at the nadir of the global financial crisis. So it is extreme. However, if you look at the Congressional Budget Office, which is shown here on the slide, we don't really plan on changing our current budget deficit spending. So now if you're one of the many people who have been, ourselves included, somewhat mystified as to the economic resilience, particularly this year, in the face of short-term interest rates climbing from 0% to 5.5%, look no further than these budget deficit figures. So 6.4 approximate budget deficit has translated into magically, or maybe magically, not magically, 6% nominal GDP growth this year. Because of this, JPAL can raise interest rates to prohibitive levels And you're going to continue to see economic resilience if we continue to flood the market with one to two trillion dollars of printed money every single year. So the natural knock on orders of this is going to be a naturally higher rate of inflation, and that's going to force them to hold a naturally higher rate of interest. Unfortunately, for most strategies, the market, whether you look at forward S&P 500 earnings estimates, which we'll touch on next, if you look at inflation break-evens, if you look at Fed fund futures and longer-term interest rate swaps, which kind of 
is the market's estimate of where rates are going to be. The market is in no uncertain terms betting on a resumption of the 2019 and pre-2019 status quo, but we are in a step function, different economic environment, and it's going to require a radically different investment approach. Slide three shows, I think, one of the most important trends for people that are anchoring to their equity investments, where yes, equities have done phenomenally well. You look at all types of academic studies and it says you'll do eight, 10, maybe even over 10% long-term in equities if you blend in global and small stocks, but it all comes back to price. And I think that obviously price elevated right now at about 20 times forward earnings is one thing, but then take a step back and unpack what actually goes into those earnings figures. So here on this chart, you can see the non-financial corporations in America, their profit margins over the past, call it 13 years. And we use this because we think this is a much cleaner measure than the S&P 500 reported margins. A, a lot of those companies are financials, which are distorted by uh, net interest margins and things like that, but also B, the accounting gimmickry in the S&P 500 is pretty pronounced. So this is the NIPA profits account. You can pull it off of the St. Louis Fed, uh, the FRED right. website. So this shows you the average corporate profit margin for about 10 years leading up to the global pandemic. Um, that was about 11 and a half percent. And then all of a sudden you saw this huge spike to where we've averaged closer to 15 percent post pandemic. And just unpack that logically, what has driven that change? Well, what's driven it is that you had a huge influx of revenue growth vis-a-vis -vis inflation, and the companies were able to push on all of that price due to latent demand and supply shortages in the economy. That's always the first order effect of inflation. The problem is that as inflation matures 18, 24 months out, that's when the cost lines start to catch up and you're seeing a flattening of those profit margins. But the bigger problem is not just that the market is anticipating the resumption of these inflated profit margins. If you look at consensus estimates for S&P earnings for this year and the following two years, if you unpack the revenue growth and then the earnings number, the market's actually betting in further multiple expansion to levels consistent with the peak of the pandemic related stimulus. I would certainly be willing to take the other side of that bet and look elsewhere for my investment solutions. In addition to the trouble in terms of the expectations and what is priced into the market in terms of earnings, this chart shows going back about 20 years to 2020, the forward earnings yield on the S&P 500 is the blue line. The effective federal funds rate is the red line. Now you can see that the last time that the federal funds rate was higher than the forward earnings yield on the S&P 500 was back in 2001. So basically for the last 20 years, you have not really had a viable competition for interest for bonds, or excuse me, for equities in the shape of bonds, especially when you saw earnings yields, let's see, going out to 2011, all the way through 2017 or so, where the spread on forward earnings yields on the S&P 500 were hundreds of basis points in excess of the risk-free rate. And bear in mind, there's growth or theoretical growth associated with that forward yield. For the first time in 20 years, we've actually crossed that threshold again, where the federal funds rate is higher than the forward earnings yield on the S&P 500. And again, I think that that is going to have profound impacts, particularly on the highly valued technology complex. So if you think about what are these companies, they're ultra long duration assets, where by definition, the value of these companies is in the terminal value, which is call it 10 to infinite years out. That is an ultra sensitive calculation to interest rates. And now that money is no longer free, you can actually see that those companies are going to be under pressure, A, from a profit margin standpoint, but then also B, and perhaps more importantly, from a valuation standpoint. Personally, I think the poster child for this dynamic, which is going to be manifested in many more companies in the coming weeks, months, and years, is a company called Nextera Energy Partners. So this is a subsidiary of a utility in Florida 
that was growing its renewable portfolio of power generation at about eight and a half percent a year over the past five or six years. It was doing this by using effectively zero percent cost of equity to bid on renewable projects with stabilized yields of three to four percent. So now that you actually have a competitive cost of capital, the stock has gone from $86 to $20. And arguably, none of these projects are economic at current rates. So think about all of these companies that have funded projects at low single digit or negative IRRs using free equity. Once that low cost of equity is taken away, the business model just simply doesn't work. And that's why we're so cautious on the broader market and think that people really need to rethink their investment allocations. So just to summarize everything that we've said, I think basically what we're, we're arguing here is that we're going to have higher volatile inflation, which is effectively going to force higher and volatile interest rates. In looking for parallels to this economic environment, I think you need to look really no further than the year 2000 and then also the 1970s. So this chart shows you the 2000s, and I'll touch on that in just a moment. But if we go back to the 1970s and compare that to the year 2000, you were having the nifty 50 bubble basically implode in U.S. stocks, where it was the large quality conglomerates that were growing rapidly and getting very aggressive multiples. Then you saw interest rates starting to rise along with inflation. Similar dynamic in 2000, you had the technology bubble burst. You saw competitive costs of capital. You saw Fed funds cross the forward earnings yield on the uh, S&P 500. So what worked in these environments? Uh, the old regime, which I will loosely tie to the Nifty 50 and then directly tie to the current era and certainly the, two, the 1990s. The old regime was tech stocks, growth stocks, mega caps, which is a function of passive investing and indexation. The new era is going to require real assets, particularly natural resources, value stocks, small cap stocks, and critically active management. So just to prove this point, if you were to look at this graph here on the left, going back to kind of the fallout of the tech bubble and look at the parallels to today, the dollar index, the CPI, the Fed funds rate, and the interest as a percentage of, of uh, GDP. What worked for the ensuing seven years? Well, upstream natural resource stocks uh, were up about fivefold. Um, the S&P 500 was up about 50%. The dollar index lost 30% of its value, even more. Um, or sorry, the value index was up about it was up about 60%. The overall S&P was up only 25. So there was a lot of value to be had, again, through these verticals, the real asset bucket, the value bucket. I don't have small cap on there, but small cap did great. And then, of course, active management, probably context for a much longer. And hopefully I can come back and talk about this another time. But the unwinding of the passive bubble and the passive bid for all these mega caps and all these highly valued tech stocks. So, again, that's what we think the new world is going to look like. It's very different from the old world and uh, happy to take some questions along those lines. Um, you know, one of the recurring themes that we're, we're seeing with the guests that we're having is A, inflation, uh, B, real assets, commodities. Um, so if you look at these, these prior kind of markets, whether it's Nifty 50 or the tech boom or the you know, magnificent, magnificent seven for right now, when, when can we anticipate the shift of value? Because we would have thought that you would have already seen it with rising interest rates the way they are. Yeah, I think that's a great question. And I think that there's two, there's two factors. One is that the market continues to believe and look at Fed fund futures, look at interest rate swaps, look at all of forward earnings estimates that we're going back to a 2019 world. I think for a variety of reasons that that is just not feasible. You're starting to see it. You know, we're recording this in the middle of October. You're starting to see the beginning of that crack. You saw Tesla yesterday report uh, vehicle level margins less than General Motors. Um, so again, I, I think that once the passive bid relents, and there's that's it's never going to relent because you have all of these defined programs for retirement that automatically goes into low cost beta. But once beta stops working, 
And we were almost there at the end of last year. Just unfortunately, the Magnificent Seven just came tearing out of the gates this year. But I think once it stops working and people are forced to look at different allocations, those fund flows can be violent. A, because the indices and the large cap has been relying on such a consistent bid. But then also, there's just not the raw materials for a lot of these other companies to accommodate those fund flows. So unfortunately, a lot of it correlates back to sentiment. And I don't know and I can't really forecast when the sentiment shifts. But it does seem as though we're seeing the very beginnings of that sentiment shift. So you mentioned small cap and you mentioned commodities. Is it going to be commodities across the board or are there going to be specific commodities that are going to benefit more than others? We focus on capacity constrained commodities. So we really want to focus on things where there's not a lot of incremental supply that can come online. If it can, can come online, it's very high cost and very long lead time. Uh, also, is there a narrative that supports the demand profile without the capital investment? I can think of no two better markets than energy and copper. So with energy, if you go back two years, everybody said 2019 was peak consumption. Now, even the most optimistic um, green forecasts are saying that consumption is probably going to grow through 2030. Uh, I would take the over on that. But because of a variety of trends, whether it's politics, it's ESG, it's poor returns on current investments, we haven't seen the capital go in to support this demand. So I think that that's going to be a very big dynamic, particularly over the next five to 10 years. And I don't honestly know if there is a supply solution. Copper is really the other side of that coin where we will and globally continue to pursue aggressive electrification. That does not happen without a minimum of 50% growth, probably more like 100% growth in the current base of copper supply. Nobody is spending the money to actually grow that supply. And in places where they are, there's labor issues in South America. There's water issues. Um, so again, it's a very difficult equation to solve from the supply side, even if the market wakes up to where there is demand. I think that as you get kind of further down that food chain in terms of commodities between that demand inelasticity balance, uh, it really becomes idiosyncratic where you need to focus on where is there inelasticity without a big supply response potential. So are there any business models within any of those asset classes that you mentioned, whether it's a uh, small cap, whether it's value, whether it's commodities that, that make sense? Yeah, that's actually going to be probably in addition to just focusing on the best assets, the best jurisdiction, the best management teams, the business model might actually be the most important variable because you need a scalable business model where investors can actually earn consistent rates of return as this cycle matures. So we focus on what we call real assets with a capital light business model. What that means is high operating margins and very high operating leverage, i.e. scale, and limited reinvestment requirements. So this is critical because a lot of companies with a lot of capital intensity are going to have to have are going to have continued rising costs as the cycle matures and then have even higher reinvestment risk as they need to replace resource. The capital light companies have the ability to compound. So we believe that our subset of companies that we focus on in our funds actually can make a cyclical risky subset of an industry become a long-term compounding vehicle if you pick the right assets with the right business model and then buy them at the right valuation. What would an example of a, a company like that be? The best example would be royalty businesses. So Horizon has followed royalties in anything from energy to precious metals to base metals, even things like pharmaceuticals and music for decades. But just to simplify the business model for the purposes of this uh, interview, a royalty is basically a free override on the revenue of an asset. So let's use, use a copper mine. The copper miner spends a couple billion dollars to dig the mine. It takes them 15 years to produce. 
It might cost them a couple dollars per pound to actually extract the resource. However, if you have a royalty, you own a percentage of gross revenue and you have zero participation in operating expenses or capital expenditures. So what that means is if copper is at five, you're making great money because you're making X percent on five. If copper is at one and the, and the, the mine is losing copious amounts of money, you're still generating free cash flow because you have a revenue interest on the top line and then no participation in OPEX or CAPEX. It's also really incredible because you get a full participation on somebody else's growth CAPEX without contributing any money yourself. And so royalties are really the core of many of our strategies. In some cases, 50% of, uh, of assets in some of our dedicated real asset strategies. Is there a time when the actual miner would do better than the royalty model? Yes, yeah, certainly. And so it's all about managing risk and managing duration. So if I had a crystal ball and told you that oil was going to be at $300 by the end of the year, royalties are going to do great, but you want to own the most speculative, leveraged, low quality energy producer that basically is a stub call option on the price of oil. Um, because again, there's a lot more inherent leverage in those companies to the price of oil. I mean, you could get even further uh, leverage yet just buying uh, swaps, but just going back to the, to the uh, equity universe, the problem is, let's say something does happen where energy goes down or there's a disruption or service costs go up or reinvestment uh, issues come on the, um, become an issue. There's a lot more risk to that business model. And I don't want to bet on oil going to 300. I want something where I can earn a very nice double digit rate of return under the status quo but then have that free call option on that rising production and on that rising price level. James, can you give us an example of accounting gimmicks that you mentioned on this chart? So I'd say that there's, there's two things. One is these are operating profits that are reported for the S&P 500 when they, when they report these forward earnings. But like a great example that I think might be interesting to your listeners is if you look at a lot of the mega tech companies, they've increased the useful lives of their servers and their software and their intellectual property recently such that they have to they are depreciating it on a longer timetable to actually inflate current earnings to me this chart in regards to the budget math and the exponential growth of interest expenses is just mind-blowing when you Yeah, that's a great point. You would think that the Treasury and the Fed would actually be in communications about where the terminal level of rates was going to be. But again, if you back up just 12 months, even the Federal Reserve Board of Governors, if you looked at their famous dot plot, people thought that we were basically going to be rolling over in the back half of 23 where rates were already going to be going down. Certainly the swaps market and Fed fund futures was pricing that in. It was definitely pricing in more than the dot plot. So I think that the fiscal side has actually caught even these PhDs by surprise. But to your point, as we start rolling over debt at twos and threes and paying fours and fives, that becomes a bigger and bigger problem where if you notice on this slide, we're going to have one trillion dollars of debt service by 2028 uh, under the status quo using the CBO budget projections, which actually uses a lower rate than forward markets imply. It also assumes zero recession. So obviously, if there is some sort of recession between now and 2028, the budget deficit is not going to get better. It's going to get a lot worse. So. These might be the most sanguine assumptions possible, and they still look pretty bad. If that's the case, what what is the what is the resolution to this? Is it austerity? What what? How do you get out of this quagmire? 
So again, that's a great question. And I, I just saw an interview with Jeff Gunlock and he basically came to the same conclusion that we did. There's, there's basically three solutions. Uh, I don't know if I'd even call them solutions, but to your point, one is austerity, but austerity has been tried in Europe. Uh, basically it imploded. Everybody was voted out of office, but it would also collapse the system. You know, the, the cure would kill the patient. So I don't think austerity is even viable. Uh, the other option is default. So let's again just assume for a moment that a U.S. federal government formal default on debt uh, is not viable. So the only other viable option is some form of debasement where you have to debase the real value of the debt. And one way to do that is to basically inflate. So the first slide I had showed you how we reduced this enormous jet to debt to GDP through letting inflation run hot for the past couple of years. Um, the other way to do it, I think, Keith, is ultimately if the bond market calls bluff and it's kind of what the bond market's doing right now, if you look at what's happening on the longer end of the curve, you basically have to go back to QE. So I don't see any way around the government going back to some form of yield curve control and some sort of form of QE, particularly if they're going to be acting in a crisis. And if that does happen, you are going to want to own real assets in very serious size. I would imagine if you're a CEO in this environment, um, it's as important to be a good capital allocator as it is uh, some of the other kind of drivers of, of growth, uh, you know, whether it's product specific or region specific. Um, so is it going to be the good capital allocators that are going to be the leaders in the market? I think valuation is going to be important. So some of these companies, even if you've done an incredible job, if you're trading at 30 or 35 times forward earnings, and a lot of this, old, this embedded growth and profitability was based on non-repeatable factors, I just don't know how much you can do. But from people that are starting and companies that are starting from a regional base in terms of where's your capital structure, where's your valuation, where's your growth, CEOs can create a lot of value here. I think being patient and being prudent. Um, but again, I think it's going to come down more to it's just such a distorted market. You just really have to focus on what is the asset you are buying and what is the value you're paying for. And then hopefully there's a good management team that can be stewards of that asset. James, when you speak with financial advisors and you take a look at um, how they're allocating to real assets, um, where do they take a piece of in the traditional 60-40 portfolio? That's a great question because real assets do have a yield. Um, you know, we tend to skew more to the uh, natural resource side of the real asset universe as opposed to the infrastructure and real estate. So our portfolios have about a 3% yield, but with a pretty nice growth component. Um, I tell people, look, I, I think that you don't want to own the S&P 500 today. I just can't see how that's going to meet your needs. So I would suggest taking a lot more of your real asset allocation out of your traditional equities. That being said, I certainly wouldn't want to be a holder of bonds, certainly government bonds longer term. So you need something that's going to store the value of your money as opposed to paying you back fiat on fiat. So I think it would behoove people to also take a portion of that bond portfolio, particularly people that have a bit more duration. 